coming. Uh, we have a very exciting guest speaker tonight, Jeff Chernoff, uh, who's spoken to us before. He's coming back again by popular demand uh, <laughs> to speak uh, to us about insurance, and specifically two topics, flood insurance and assignment of benefits. And we've been talking a little bit about uh, both of those topics, but Jeff can go much more detail in how it affects us as real estate agents with the flood insurance, but then especially the assignment of benefits once we have a homeowner in a home what are the pros and cons, what are things that we need to know about that. So with that, Jeff, go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, Nico. All right, so what does flood insurance cover? Just shout it out, this is the interactive part. Floods. Floods, okay. A flood being defined as rising water, right? right? Like from a hurricane. From a hurricane, uh, depending on where it hits, yes. So if it comes in from the ground up, then that would be flood. If it breaks a window and the water comes in, then that typically is homeowners. Uh, does it cover a pipe bursting? I don't think so. It does not. That is homeowners. It's a very common misnomer. I get that question quite frequently, so that's why I ask. What so else? You're, you're oh. actually talking about natural events, right? Say not, that again. You're talking about natural events, not something that's man-made. That Correct. It, it has to result in rising waters that causes damage. So even to a certain extent, um, storm drains overflowing. If it's due to rain, then yes, that would be covered. But if it's some sort of uh, man-made accident, that probably would not be covered under flood insurance. Uh, so it does cover um, what what parts of the home or condo would uh, flood insurance cover? Anything on the outside? Okay, yes. What about ground level? Ground level. It can cover above if you have a, a truly, truly catastrophic uh, flood. Um, although it's only going to cover up to 250000 at least on a basic policy, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, will it cover a detached garage? Yeah. That's a good question because it's not part of the, uh, the, the main structure. I would say no. What do you guys say? Uh, Okay. It will cover a detached garage. There are sublimits. It's usually 10% of the overall limit. So at $250,000, we cover $25,000 with one caveat, that there's not living area and that it's not uh, finished. It has to be, well, it can be a finished detached garage, but that there's not living area and it's not being used for some other purpose other than uh, storage or um, car access. If, it, uh, if it's a mother-in-law suite or if it's for some other purpose, then uh, you actually need to have a separate flood policy to cover it. Uh, what about a fence? Fence covered with a flood? That's, that's a tough one too. I would think that it would be anything that's part of the structure, but that could be part of the structure too. So the answer is if you're talking national flood insurance policies, which is what I'm answering these questions based on, the answer is no. Private flood, the answer is maybe, just depends. So, okay. All right, as a reminder, and I've said this before, your clients believe real estate agents are perceived experts on, in this particular example, homeowner's insurance, flood insurance, elevation certificates, certificates, what is and is not covered, all elements of the real estate transaction. It's okay to say, I don't know. However, you need to have experts that are able to answer the things that you don't know, whether that's a title insurance agent, whether that's a uh, homeowners or flood insurance agent, whether that's uh, a mortgage person. Building these sorts of contacts are critical to you being successful in the real estate industry. So our agenda. Today we're only gonna talk about a couple of things. Understanding the main and primary differences between the National Flood Insurance Program, which is affiliated with FEMA, which of course is backed by the United States government, and then private market flood. We're going to talk about assignment of benefits, full disclosure. I have a very specific tilt that lines up pretty well with real estate agents, but if any um, uh, trial bar attorneys are watching this video, they might disagree with my assessment, so I fully am open to that. However, I do have a very biased tilt on it. And then just general questions and answers uh, as it comes to uh, flood insurance or assignment of benefits or anything related to homeowners or uh, flood. Uh, as always, you can uh, interrupt with questions, raise your hand, whatever, just shout out, um, and we'll go from there. Okay, so this is a very, very basic comparison. It's not going to cover everything, but the basic general uh, difference is the National Flood Insurance Program. It's backed by the U.S. government, whereas the private market is backed by a, a private company, which is usually required to have reinsurance. That reinsurance is typically based on the concept of 
a once in a 100 year event or once in a 250 year event uh, referring to hurricanes or something catastrophic that would cause flooding. Uh, for the most part, private market is um, based in Florida. They're just starting to branch out into other states. So for example, Missouri, which floods um, when you have the, the Mississippi and Missouri River, uh, that I don't necessarily know how that uh, factors in when it comes to those types of events, but primarily the reinsurance is based on hurricanes. Oftentimes, if the home is built pre-flood map, so let's talk about this. Uh, in order to be in the National Flood Insurance Program, a community, and there are a variety of different communities uh, in an area, um, have to actually uh, petition and request to be in it. So very famous example, Las Vegas until I think 2006, 2007, um, relatively recently, was not in uh, the National Flood Insurance Program. And when they had a flood, um, there was, they had to go into what's called an emergency program. Uh, and so you ha actually have to petition and request to be entered into it. Uh, you are in what's called the emergency program first, and then after a specific period of time, you're entered into the uh, regular program. Um, or preferred depending on uh, some factors. So if the home was built pre-flood insurance rate map, which are pre-firm, uh, it means that oftentimes they're gonna be built below something that's called base flood elevation, which specifically means that, as I was talking a little bit before, uh, base flood elevation refers to storm surge. So South Tampa, which as we all know in the last uh, hurricane, Hurricane Irma, they were very concerned about storm surge. Well, South Tampa says that, uh, and maps say that storm surge would go nine feet above sea level. So anything that is below that um, storm surge or perceived storm surge is considered uh, below base flood elevation. Anything above it is considered above base flood elevation. If your home was built pre-firm, pre-flood insurance rate map, then you may be eligible for a flood subsidy. It's not something you have to apply for, it's simply when uh, an insurance agent provides a flood quote, it's automatically factored in uh, into that. Um, so fun fact, there are about 400,000 homes in the United States that receive some type of a flood subsidy. 50,000 of them are in Pinellas County and Hillsborough County. So flood subsidies really do impact the real estate market, particularly in the Tri-County area. Uh, and I can spend a lot of time talking about the legislation as to how things changed, um, but I've spent enough time talking about flood subsidies. As compared to the private market, there's no flood subsidies. It, the rate is what the rate is. It's backed by reinsurance. And so oftentimes, um, homes that are built in that uh, sort of um, scenario, if they're receiving a flood subsidy, it's not as, a, it's not as a, a cheap uh, if in the private market. However, it's oftentimes cheaper than if you take into account the fact that they don't have a flood subsidy. Elevation certificates. Uh, if the home was built post uh, flood insurance rate map or post firm, it's going to require an elevation certificate. Uh, a lot of times in the private market, there is not an elevation certificate that's required. Waiting period. So the National Flood Insurance Program, I, I will play out a real life scenario that happened starting five days out from Hurricane Irma making landfall. My cell phone rings. Hi Jeff, this is one of your clients. Can I get a flood insurance quote? Office rings. Hi Jeff, this is one of your clients. Can I get a flood insurance quote? I probably uh, got at least seven to 10 clients and I'm just one agent in my office. If you look at all of our agents, we probably had about 20 or 30 calls come in asking for uh, a flood insurance quote. Because of that, unless there is a loan transaction that is occurring, or it is a, a renewal to an existing policy that you're looking to simply move over to a different company, uh, there is a 30-day waiting period. Interestingly enough, if you're working with an affluent client that's not getting a mortgage, they are also subject to the 30-day wait. So you need to be aware of that and make sure that you set closing far enough out that all that can be uh, proved and bound. Uh, private market, there is a waiting period. Um, but it's usually around five days. It's not as, um, as severe. Uh, and again, private market flood um, has been around for multiple markets for about, I'll say five or six years. And so those things can change. When it first started, there was no waiting period. Now they've moved to a five day waiting period. 
five to 10, depending on the company. Uh, requires funding. As I mentioned, the National Flood Insurance Program is backed by the United States government. Anything that is backed by the United States government typically requires a line item of the federal budget. Uh, and specifically, it's FEMA's budget. So when you hear of conversations, whether you're talking about um, GTAR or you're just following the news and they say um, the flood uh, needs to be uh, renewed, or what that's referring to is the specific funding source. We have, um, we've been in situations, typically when they reauthorize flood insurance, because it, is, it has to be an act of, of Congress that's signed by the President of the United States, uh, they typically authorize it for at least five years. This uh, time round, um, insurance companies are requesting a 10-year reauthorization. We'll see if it happens. Right now we're on continuing resolution seven or eight. The last time we went through the reauthorization process, it took 12 continuing resolutions before they did a five-year authorization. So oftentimes what will happen is if you have policies that are on the books, but there's no money that's available, to pay claims, they will continue to take premiums, and then once that money is available, they'll retroactively renew that policy. Um, you are not able to bind new coverage, so that's also something that's critical when it comes to closings. Uh, right now there's funding through November, I believe specifically November 30th, to get us through hurricane season, which could obviously be a big deal, but come December 1st at 12, p 12 a.m., the uh, funding runs out unless, uh, Jack, you look like you have a question. Are we on a continuing resolution for we are. fiscal year 18? We're on a continuing resolution for flood insurance coverage, not necessarily for fiscal year 18. Remember how I mentioned earlier they've separated the two funding sources? Okay. So yes, we are on a continuing resolution for fl uh, flood insurance FEMA coverage. I can't speak to uh, the fiscal year specifically. I believe a budget was uh, passed for fiscal year 18. You said it was a line item on, on FEMA. Yeah. So uh, no funding requirement uh, in the private market because it's backed by a private insurance uh, company with reinsurance. The funding is there uh, throughout. Um, typically the reinsurance is uh, applied for and secured once or twice a year depending on that company. So there are some tremendous benefits when it comes to that sort of a thing. Recognized by mortgage companies, the National Flood Insurance Program is the standard by every mortgage company. Uh, most mortgage companies are recognizing a private market, but there are some uh, that are persnickety or that have very specific expectations that the private market does not meet. Uh, but private market companies, I would say probably, I don't want to put a percentage on it, but a majority of them, or possibly even a super majority, uh, recognize private flood. The National Flood Insurance Program, the cap on dwelling limit is 250000 personal property 100000 with private market flood, a lot of times they will go up to 500000 on the uh, dwelling limit and personal property. I've seen higher than 100000 but a lot of times that kind of is the standard. Um, it can be beneficial for a home that, say it's a $400,000 home. A lot of times they can get an excess flood policy depending on various factors. Um, but if they can't, maybe private market makes sense simply because it's going to put everything under one flood insurance policy. Actual cash value, um, there's no concept of replacement cost when it comes to um, flood insurance. It's based on actual cash value with the National Flood Insurance Program. Private market, the replacement cost value, it's an endorsement that typically is available. Uh, and so those are all things to keep in mind. I went through that incredibly quickly. Questions, comments, thoughts? So with the waiting period, at least with the, the federal event. Yeah. If there's a loan transaction that's occurring, the the 30 day waiting period is waived. Okay. It's only if you're working with a home that is not uh, not participating in a loan transaction, a cash uh, uh, scenario, or um, or if it's something that there's not funding available through uh, through Congress. Okay. But yeah, in a, I would say how if you had to give a ballpark, how many of your transactions would you say uh, require a loan uh, amount or some type of a mortgage? Yeah, so we're talking about maybe 1% to 2% of transactions that don't fall into well, that. Don't the, the cash people uh, think in terms of, well, I'm just self-insured? Uh, yeah, if you are, if you are, a ca if you are cash um, 
If you're buying it for cash, you are not required to get a flood insurance policy. Just not like you're not uh, required to get a homeowner's insurance policy. Right. But if you there, so there's two types of, of cash buyers, people that, uh, that are willing to risk it and simply self-insure. There are also people that want to uh, self-insure up to a certain amount. So I've seen in some instances, cash buyers getting a $50,000 policy, even though the home is valued at 125,000 simply so that that way it gives them something. Think of it like a deductible. They're willing to pay a uh, deductible and then um, they want the 50,000 of coverage. Other, yeah, Joseph? Uh, yeah, what about um, if they're buying a condo and mm -hmm. paying cash, then you're saying that they're not required to get the, uh, the flood insurance. However, wouldn't they be under the blanket of the condo Con Condos are a little different. I, I, when it comes to homeowners, it's its own thing. Because condos are regulated by um, a state statute, and condo associations are regulated by state statute, they are in a different scenario. Now, if they are, uh, it's a cash condo purchase, uh, any of that additional coverage or from that drywall in that we're talking about, there may be some gray area there so long as there's condo association flood coverage and it meets whatever requirements, but that's a, it's, it's a gray area, so I wouldn't want to, uh, on a recorded tape to live in perpetuity, ever uh, put a hard and fast rule on that. So uh, if it only involves the inside that they're not covered by, then wouldn't the, uh, the homeowner's insurance take care of it? No, if it's, so any type of insurance, there are certain perils that are insured against. So homeowners is flood, or excuse me, homeowners is fire, homeowners is, is a hurricane, as long as there's wind coverage or hurricane coverage that's associated with it, lightning, those types of things. Flood in most instances are specifically excluded. There are some condo policies that exist uh, that, and they tend to be more in the excess and surplus that will list flood as a covered peril, but oftentimes the premiums are much more expensive, and so you have to weigh that in comparison to what you can get uh, with a state admitted uh, company and carrier. Okay. I have one other question. Yes, sir. Uh, is there a there is a deductible, and um, typically on the National Flood Insurance Program, there's a deductible for both the, the dwelling coverage um, and also the contents coverage or the personal property. So those are two separate deductibles. In the case of the private market, there's simply one deductible um, that uh, I believe there's one deductible that applies regardless of circumstance. All right, so now we're gonna do a, a case study. Which is better? These are the types of things that insurance agents have to deal with all the time. As I mentioned, you all are perceived experts when it comes to insurance, so you should at least have to think about this for about two minutes. It's a 1950s home in South Tampa. It's a hazardous flood zone, so A or V. It's negatively elevated. It is receiving a flood subsidy, and the home replacement value is 500,000. How many of you would say the NFIP is the better choice? Okay, we got one. And how many of you would say private market is the better choice? I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, I'm tending to go with Nico, but... Uh, really, you're going with your brokerage director. I never would have guessed why. <laughs> to this, the sure bet. Sure. <laughs> the answer, the National Flood Insurance Program. But you're also right, Joseph. It's not meant, to, that example is not meant to be clear cut. I could give you several reasons as to why the National Flood Insurance Program is a better option. I could um, give you several reasons the private market is better. But this is one of the most important caveats when it comes to the National Flood Insurance Program. Currently, based on current laws, this could change at any time with legislation and with reauthorization. When you receive a flood subsidy, if they leave the program and then re-enter it, they may lose that flood, flood subsidy. So if you're only paying $2,000 or $3,000, but the actual cost would be $12,000, stay, hold on to this as long as you possibly can. Because oftentimes, here's what's, what's interesting. The National Flood Insurance Program, and for any of you that uh, follow John Oliver, he actually did um, a pretty good uh, uh, detailed deep dive into um, the National Flood Insurance Program. But um, if you have a claim they have to renew you, even if you have what's called severe repetitive loss. It is, it is a guaranteed renewable. They can charge you for the amount of claims that you've had. They can, uh, they can choose not to insure you from the get-go because of previous claims. But if you are on the books, they, ha they have to at least offer a renewal. 
oftentimes what will happen in private market is that if you have a claim, um, maybe you have two claims or three claims in a short period of time, they may non-renew you and then you have to go into the National Flood Insurance Program. Think of it like a citizen's when we're talking about Florida homeowners wind, that sort of a thing. Um, and so if they're receiving a flood subsidy and they run the risk of losing it, you want to hold on to that as long as possible. The National Flood Insurance Program is not perfect by any stretch. There, there are definitely pros and cons, but if you have to go back to, you guys wouldn't as real estate folks, but if I had to go back to a client and say, yeah, we saved you $1,000, but now you had a claim and now we're gonna charge you another 9,000. It's not gonna look so good on me. It's probably not gonna look so good on my errors and omissions and, it's prob and the client's not gonna feel very good about that. So in this specific answer, that's why I chose the National Flood Insurance Program. Which is better, NFIP or private market? Another case study, 2014 home in New Tampa, non-hazardous flood zone, so B, C, or X. The home valuation is 600,000. How many of you would say private market? I'm not even needed. Yeah. How many of you would say NFIP? So we had three for a private market. We had one, you don't need it, why buy it? And anyone that would say NFIP? Okay. It's not required, but interestingly enough, an X zone will have a flood once every 500 years. Uh, once every 500 years. So just because, as if you notice the uh, ver verbiage I used, non-hazardous flood zone, just because it's not in a hazardous flood zone and your mortgage company requires it, doesn't mean that you can't get a flood. In this particular answer, I would say private market because you're insuring them for 500,000, even though the home is valued at 600,000, it's certainly more than 250,000. They may want replacement cost contents because it's probably gonna be a more, um, a higher value home. There's no risk of moving back and forth between each uh, program in this particular example. Um, the National Fund Insurance Program does do MAP re-rating, so ignore that obvious fact. Um, but for this particular example, based on the information that we have, this uh, would be a good option. And I said New Tampa. If I had said South Tampa, well, a lot of times when we uh, do a flood zone determination, they actually show a picture of where it is. And so, uh, all right. The computer that's sitting right there, the water's here. Computer is the flood zone. This is uh, where the home risks. All they have to do is a, re is a re rate of the map, and now they're in a flood zone. The great thing about having flood insurance and why you should consider buying it, even if you don't have to, is that if you have a flood insurance policy and you are in a non hazardous zone and then it's moved into a hazardous zone, you pay the rate that you had in a non hazardous rate. So for $250,000 of coverage, that's $450 as of 2018 pricing. Whereas oftentimes, if a home is uh, positively elevated, it could be as much as seven or $800. So there's still a savings and a reason why as to why you would recommend coverage. I personally live in New Tampa and I have flood, and coverage, flood coverage. It's not just because I sell it for peace of mind. Okay, assignment of benefits. Tell me what it is. Yeah, well, you, you also currently serve on the Greater Tampa Area Real, uh, Realtors yeah. Board of Directors. I hope you know what it is. What is it? I guess it's kind of like an insurance policy. Beneficiary. It does involve, bene uh, it does involve beneficiaries, but in this particular case, it's talking about you as the insured. You are the person that's benefiting or receiving benefits. What else do you guys know about it? We'll spend a little more time on this then. An assignment of benefits, it's just, it's a blanket definition. Anytime an insured gives a third party the right to collect benefits on behalf of the insured. You go to a doctor's office, you typically will assign an assignment of benefits form. That's how you don't get charged $10,000 for your procedure, you get charged your copay of $20. They will reach out to the insurance company and if you read the fine print, it usually says something like, this is assuming that uh, we get this procedure covered. If not, you're responsible for, the, for uh, whatever's left after the copay. So health insurance is for services rendered. For auto insurance, think windshields. So if you've heard advertisements, this is the biased part. If you've heard advertisements about, um, we'll pay you $100, in order to get your windshield repair, or we'll give you a gift card for $100 to get your windshield repair. Oftentimes, they will make you sign an assignment of benefits form, and magically they'll get eight or nine hundred dollars. So, from a profit standpoint, they they uh, are 
able to be more profitable. For homeowners insurance right now, we're seeing it with water damage. Water damage is the key thing. So assignment of benefits, why is it a problem? Water mitigation, oftentimes, they're not doing this as much anymore because they're not, the insurance companies are preventing it. Water mitigation repairing prior to inspection. So picture this scenario, it's story time with Uncle Jeff. It's three o'clock in the morning, pipe breaks. By the way, the most common insurance claim that we have in our office, it's more common than a fire, more common than a hurricane, more common than a lightning strike, pipe breaks. Okay, it's three o'clock in the morning, somehow you're sleeping and you feel a splash of water on your face. So you're up, you're well aware of it. You look at it, you see this giant puddle that is up above your ceiling dripping onto your thing. So you know that there's something. Um, you might shut the water off if you're, if you're thinking you know, rationally, but it's three o'clock in the morning. So you may reach out to a water uh, mitigation company or do a quick Google search and say, uh, pipe, or, or, pipe leak, what do I do? Call a plumber or you call a water mitigation specialist. They come out and they say, well, you have a water leak, it's, it's clear. We did our test and you have a water leak. We can fix it for you right now. Just sign here, here, and here, and we'll go ahead and take care of it. Well, you just signed an assignment of benefits form. Again, three o'clock in the morning, you don't care what you're signing. You don't want water gushing and destroying your home. So you have now, uh, in order for them to do any work, they're gonna require this form to be signed. You sign that form. As such, um, what that means is now that they are able to collect. Originally when this was happening, and this has been happening in, in I wanna say as early as 2013 or 2014, that's when these sort of things started to happen. Um, what is interesting, like it or not, the longer that the state of Florida goes without a hurricane, companies have to get creative in order to make a profit. And so when we had the sinkhole situation back in 2008, 2009, 2010, a lot of times it was public adjusters, we hadn't had a hurricane. Everyone needs to eat. Um, so water mitigation, this is their, their version of sinkhole fraud. There are some very consumer friendly laws in the state of Florida when it comes to collecting court costs, okay? So what that means, if you, Joe Insured, decide to sue your insurance company because you have a water claim and they say, it could be any claim, but we'll go with a water claim. And they say, well, all of your bids, your competitive bids came back and, and it's $15,000. We had someone come out and they uh, say it's 12,000. So we're only gonna give you 12,000. Well, that doesn't work, it's gonna be 15,000. So let's say that you, um, you go to mediation, you go to arbitration, you're still not satisfied. Take them to court, you sue them. If you as the insured get at least, get $1 or more, the insurance company is required to pay your court costs. It's so that big insurance company can't um, try and squeeze uh, consumers. It's a very pro-consumer law, it's a great law, except you just assigned your benefits away. So now, contractor is able to collect those, okay? Additionally, when you have a water claim, it typically is not just a plumber. A lot of times it's flooring, a lot of times it could be ceiling. So now you're dealing with all, and, and a plumber is a plumber, that's what they do. They don't do grout work, they don't do floor repair. So they bring in another contractor. Well, that person's a subcontractor. Your water mitigation person's probably gonna be the general contractor. So each one of the subcontractors is gonna make you sign a uh, assignment of benefits. And each one of those assignment of benefits still apply. So now you, you because you were the insured, not the contractor, you're listed as being in three or four lawsuits that you don't even know about. Because guess what? There, can anyone name an industry that might be interested in just collecting court costs? Does anyone, anyone come to mind? Anyone? There's probably a billboard out there with their name on it. So because of that, you can do very well as a trial bar attorney collecting court costs. You can make a great living. So as, as I mentioned, the benefits uh, signed apply to all the contractors. Okay, before I go into that. So I just went through that incredibly quickly. Questions, thoughts, clarifications, Yeah, yes, sir. So, trying to play devil's advocate. Absolutely. I agree with you on, on your side. <laughs> that I'm biased? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I'm a homeowner, mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. Sure. My, my roof is leaking, I just want to get it done. Absolutely. Why would I not trust the contractor to do it versus have me you know, deal with insurance and, and all that? Wouldn't it just be easier for me to hand it over and say, here, you do it? Yes. 
that's exactly why. And so in a couple of screens, I'm going to talk about how insurance companies have changed it. That's part of the reason why um, insurance companies, agents, a little bit, not as much, because they're not as involved in the claims transaction. It's really a, a carrier issue. But uh, that's why they are working to get legislation passed that puts these sorts of things in place. Or um, one of the thing, pieces of legislation that we've seen has been um, mandated mediation or mandated arbitration for court costs or changing the court cost law that if it's over a certain threshold, uh, in terms of the uh, amount that's awarded, then they pay court costs. But if it's within, say, a dollar to twenty-five hundred dollars, you each pay your own, or uh, the uh, you each pay your own uh, court costs, or the person that was found um, guilty pays uh, that court cost. You know, so there's all sorts of things that they're doing. So I will talk about that uh, more in more detail in a moment. Other questions, clarifications? All right, so when legislation fails, insurance companies change the contract. The way that it works when we're talking about property and casualty, doesn't apply to life insurance because life insurance is a contract of adhesion and it's for um, a specific period of time. It's not simply a yearly contract. But with property and casualty contracts, it, if you notice, your policy period is only for one year. And so as a result, every year, even if it renews, they, uh, the insurance company reserves the right to notify you that they're cha making changes in terms of the contract. So when legislation fails on a continual basis, the insurance carrier is left with little to no choice simply to change the contract. Examples of that, personal injury coverage in auto in the state of Florida, there's now a $2,500 sublimit for chiropractors. Now you can get your full $10,000, which is, but there, there are some additional hoops you have to jump through. You have to be signed off by a doctor saying that this is, uh, the additional funds um, is, is medically necessary. So there's some additional hoops. Sinkhole. As realtors, I'm sure you guys know the difference between catastrophic ground cover collapse and traditional sinkhole coverage. Because of the legislation failing, there are very few carriers that will offer a true traditional sinkhole policy. Had elected officials been able to get things passed, we might not be in that sort of scenario. Assignment of benefit. The $10,000 water limit. I'm going to give you three examples of how assignment of benefits have impacted the average insurance uh, uh, policy. So there's a, typically what we're seeing, there's a $10,000 water limit if the home is built um, 40 years or, uh, or older. So looking at the 1970s, if it was built in 2015, we're not seeing that. That's not to say that we won't see that. We're just not seeing it at that moment. Uh, assignment of benefits. Preferred vendor deductible discounts. We have companies that in exchange for uh, agreeing to work with their preferred vendor deductible, they're gonna give you a discount on that deductible. So your deductible is 2,500. Hey, guess what? By going with our vendor approved network, you only pay 2,000. Actual cash value until inspected. I actually have a client who's dealing with a water claim that they, uh, they determined the claim was about $12,000, immediately knocked 3,900 off paying it on actual cash value. Once it's been completed and inspected by the insurance company, they will reimburse them for the remaining $3,900. So what do you guys want to hear but have not yet? So how does assignment of benefits really impact the business of being a real estate agent? What do we need to tell our clients? It's a great question. You, if you're dealing with homes that are older, you want to make sure that you're working with carriers that are going to offer more than $10,000. We had a claim. The home was built in 1912 in Hyde Park, or the home was built in 1912 in Hyde Park, $312,000 water claim. The home was insured for over a million dollars. It was a million dollar home, 25%. If you lose, if, if that claim only got $10,000, that would be very difficult. You you can't, when you have a $300,000 claim, $10,000, it just, it's just gonna insult the client, frankly. Um, and so making sure that if you're dealing with older homes, there are certain things that are oftentimes not covered fully. And so being aware of that, um, in the case of, uh, in the case of, uh, uh, making sure that there, the question that should be asked by the insurance, uh, the insured is what am I supposed to do when there's a claim? And so in that policy language, in that 50 or $60 um, policy, there's actually a detailed step-by-step -step of what the insured's responsibility is. Making sure that you at least let uh, the, the person buying the home or the condo know 
check with this because some companies will say uh, you're required to work with one of our, our vendors. Some clients will say uh, we have recommended vendors. You can use whomever you want. However, if you use whomever you want, we may pay less initially. Um, some may say before uh, we pay anything, we require an inspection of the, uh, of, of the claim or the inspection of the damage before you can get any work done. Or they may say, um, this is another one I've seen, um, you can get anything that is uh, emergency completed, but the most that we're going to pay for emergency uh, repairs is $3,000 or some random number, maybe it's $5,000. So being aware of what those things are, and if you're working with a good insurance agent, he or she should be able to at least tell you where it is in the policy or be able to reach out to the company that they're working with to get that information because we're seeing assignment of benefits issues everywhere. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Other questions or other things you were hoping to hear but did not? I have a question about pleasure. Sure. So there are some properties that are in multiple. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting thing because a lot of the flood insurance uh, policies, what they will do is they'll pull up the, the um, rate map uh, electronically and they'll just say, oh, this home's here. You can actually request what's called a manual rate. And so they will, it typically, typically takes a 24 to 48 hour turnaround time. They will actually go out to the flood map and pull it up, pull it up one of the old maps by hand. And based on longitude and latitude, they'll determine where it is. A similar uh, scenario that um, you didn't ask, but if you have multiple structures on the property, so say you do have a mother-in-law suite, mother-in-law suite is in a hazardous flood zone, the, the primary home is not. So what that means is you might have to get an elevation certificate just for the mother-in-law suite and get a flood insurance policy on that, and then you have the option of not getting a flood insurance policy on the main home. So. Um, in those sorts of scenarios, a lot of times the mortgage company is going to dictate what those terms are. So whatever the mortgage company says, in order to be able to get that loan closing, you're going to have to do it. So at least until you pay the house off. Other questions? Cool. So just as a, a review, we talked about flood, specifically some examples of the National Flood Insurance Program compared to the private market. We also talked about assignment of benefits in the overall, and then obviously we did some que uh, question and answers. What was most impactful for you all and what will you do differently having heard this presentation? Past two legislative sessions, uh, uh, assignment of benefits legislation passed out of the House um, and it never uh, passed the Senate. So it's been stalled in the Senate for the past two years. Um, didn't they just have another uh, extension so that they didn't have to vote on it yet? They just extended the. Uh... So this was the, the, the uh, assignment of benefits in, in Florida uh, government. Um, I think you're talking about the national. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so National Flood Insurance passed a continuing resolution so right. that they would give coverage through, I believe it's November 30th of 2018. Right. Anyone else? Anything that was impactful that uh, will cause you to do something differently? Well, actually, I looked on the, um, the MLS to mm -hmm. find where the flood insurance is on the, uh, uh, the cut sheet. No, Good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good. And, Excellent. Uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, like I said, I need to find a, uh, uh, 
some kind of grid that tells you, you know, what the different um, designations are. I know, I think XX or ZZ is like no, uh, you're not in a flood zone. So, so the flood zones are as follows. V, and this is from worst to best, if you will. V, 1 through 30. Actually, it's VE, V, 1 through 30. AE, A, 1 through 30. B, C, and X. Interestingly enough, the V, I believe, stands for velocity. The A uh, refers to the evacuation zone. So for those of us with Hurricane Irma, if we were in zone A, we had to evacuate. Zones B and C also refers to B and C evacuation zones, but those are considered non-hazardous flood zone areas. And then X means that uh, there is no um, uh, emergency evacuation. Okay. Good. Well, I'm glad that it's being recorded. So that yeah. I, yeah. Instead of writing it down, I have there you go. As a reference. <clears throat> Excellent. Cool. Well, thank you. Again, my name is Jeff Chernoff uh, of Insurance and Trust, and that's it. Thanks. Thank you.